So I will start to speak about uh, our adventure building a massively scalable uh, remote compiler cloud for C++. And that means uh, building a massively scalable web app in C++ for C++ to compile C++. So yeah, it's a C++ conference. So I think we're in the right place to speak about that. Um, it's um, uh, at TP actually what you are building is uh, is is a new way to feel C++. It's a new, it's a way to rethink the C++ exper experience. We want to enable developers to build faster and in a simpler manner so that they don't need to build or write build scripts themselves and that they can simply write code and uh, add value to their software instead of maintaining package management script and stuff like that. With my co-founder Yannick, we have been the CMake guys uh, of many companies in the past, uh, mainly automotive and IoT. Uh, Yannick is also really skilled in uh, electronics, uh, and uh, he did um, quite a lot in terms of business uh, creation and so. And I'm like uh, the CPP fanboy on the team, uh, so uh, we, I did everything. So we joined the ISO CPP Foundation. Uh, we, we are members since uh, the summer, and uh, uh, we hope to uh, in the future be able to to contribute back to this valuable standard uh, and. Uh, uh, bring the C++ experience to another level, actually. Um, what I will talk in, the, I will present in this, uh, this talk is uh, why C++ for web apps. Many people uh, might argue against it. Uh, it has been a, a fight for me uh, since I made my master thesis and so on. Um, and uh, how we build TP build, uh, how the software architecture is made, and uh, what we use in there. There are a lot of key rounds. Uh, I will go over them and explain them. Uh, I'm not a gatekeeper, or I try not to be. Uh, TP is about making things simple, so uh, let's go deep into it. First, before I start, uh, I will tell a little word about TP on about remote conferences. I, I, I feel like the la last time there was a CPPP, P, yeah, it's three P. Uh, it was at the uh, near the Eiffel Tower, and uh, no, because of remote conferences, I'm I'm stuck uh, near the. Um, the Prime Tower, which is uh, two, two times uh, smaller uh, in Zurich, uh, it's uh, on my on my right here. But I tell it if you want to uh, change for a city and want to work for TP, we have open position as C++ developers. And uh, there is a nice pizzeria just uh, on the on the side here, uh, nice near the Prime Tower. On our offices is just uh, 100 meter uh, away from the Prime Tower. It's not the Eiffel Tower. We don't have Boats, but uh, we we do have trains and trams. But uh, yeah, and it's small the prime floor. But but there is a, a restaurant at the top which is named the Cloud. So if you want to to join the Cloud, uh, you can join us. So first, before uh, uh, I go deeper into how we build TP, uh, I uh, wanted to uh, show you um, what it uh, it uh, means uh, for us uh, TP and uh, what. Uh, um, what we are trying to solve there. In your opinion, there are three main problems in C and C++ that we are addressing. Um, the first one being uh, the most obvious one, code reuse. Uh, dependency management is a hard thing in C++. Um, and uh, it, it is uh, like, even if there are solutions, it always requires someone to write a package my script that put things together on it in different language. It can be in CMake, it can be in Python, but in the end, uh, it requires a lot of work to just reuse code from your previous project. And it, it requires also work to adapt the dependency that you need from other people, uh, from other build systems. And uh, we are going the way, but we think there is no way it is, is a human task. We can scan the source code and generate out of it, the build script, so that we can use any code that was ever written. Sure, there are some uh, use some special case where you will need some user input at some point. But uh, in the end of uh, of the TP adventure, we should be able to build any C++ code we automatically reverse uh, source code scanner. And many of your users are already doing it. Um, I see there was a question: What about remote work from an anonymous attendee? Uh, actually, it's mixed, uh, remote work naturally, uh, but you would like the people to be near because we're a small team and we think it's more efficient to free. 
if we uh, if if we work all together uh, on the same stage. And I think it, it's worth it at the beginning in the small team. But yeah, remote work is possible as well. Definitely. So sorry. So code reuse is one problem. Dependencies and environment is another. I mean, when you have a nice code base, you have all the dependency pools and you want to build it. Uh, you have all the libraries, but you're still missing the compiler, the linker, the debugger, and uh, everything you need to run. For example, if you have a special GPU or things like this that you want to run. And this is what TP is also bringing. We are specifying uh, the environment in uh, declarative files, which goes beyond what Docker can do, because we go for Windows, Linux, and so on. And this brings TP so that you have a reusable state that uh, you can, in 10 years or even in three months, uh, reuse to build exactly the same state uh, as you had back then, so you have a reproducible build environment. And you can use it in the cloud, so you don't need to wait for an installation. Because I think one of the key problems adopting C++ is mostly because it's long to set up your machine. Not a Linux, naturally. It goes easy. But uh, when you want to install a new compiler or so, it always takes long. It downloads and so on. We bring it in the seconds to the user, actually. And the third problem, which is uh, a big one as well, but not, not everyone has it. But uh, building takes time, and uh, the developer at TP, they were drinking too, too much coffee, and we didn't add Swirl, but still, uh, they were not working. So we said, OK, we need to repurpose the algorithm that learns about the source code, how the source code is uh, made, and how we build it. We get some information of, about the scan. And with this information, actually, we are able to uh, better parallelize the build. And uh, then we bring big build uh, nodes in our cloud. Uh, that uh, allow, allow, allows to um, to build in parallel at the parallelity that is needed for the specific code base. So we we go further than uh, the file granularity. Not everything is rolled out in the in the beta currently, but you can already try it out. I would really uh, invite you to uh, enable the promo code TP double uh, colon colon build cpppp. Uh, on the subscription page to register for an account so that you can try out the cloud, play with TP. We've gone a long way uh, since we started. It's a really cool uh, system and it's working stable. So I would really invite you to test and give us feedback. We need you. We need uh, your input to improve this product and uh, to make it the best solution for C++. And it will be open source uh, fully uh, at some point. Um, so. Why C++ for web apps? Many people might ask. I mean, in, it's a story about Radventure building TP on its cloud. And uh, one of the main um, issue we had when we started is like, yeah, uh, we'd like to build uh, an application with uh, the TP algorithm that we've wrote. And we'd like to dog food it uh, because it makes sense. I will come to that later. Uh, but also for other reason, we'd like to build it in C++. And uh, we first had people that went and say, oh, no, we should do it in Ruby and Rails on PHP, and it's better because uh, uh, it's the web technologies, and you don't need to, 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 uh, to go with C++ for this. But we said, no, no, we are the C and C++ gangsta. So uh, we, uh, we decided uh, we should still do it in C++. We accepted, OK, for the front end, we won't render in a canvas with WebAssembly. We will do HTML and so on because uh, otherwise the, the experience would be terrible. But uh, we wanted to have a strong language uh, to build our application. And the reason why we, we wanted that is not just because we're C++ fanboys, as it sounds like. Uh, it's also because um, there is one reason to use uh, C++ for web apps. It's the environment. Currently, the top 10 million websites around there if you remove the video um, streaming, uh, you just take uh, a page load on the API calls. 70% uh, uh, of, of, uh, of the websites are made with PHP on other technologies. And uh, these, um, these top 10 million websites, they generate like 1.32 billion CO2 tons a year. And if we would rewrite all this in C++, we could save 47,000 CO2 tons um, of yearly emissions just if every top, if each site in the top 10 million was in C++. So Facebook did that in the past. And as they did it, uh, they had uh, uh, simply, they halved into their data center. They were in a, on PHP and they uh, 
I wrote a compiler that uh, recompiled the PHP in C++. They switched to another technology now, which is a JIT compiled and so on for different reasons. But that shares the same basics. Um, and they just could, uh, we could, from one day to another, uh, they had just half of the way of the data center used. And even if data center are using um, power uh, from renewable energies and so on, but still uh, CPUs to be produced, uh, there is a still a carbon footprint uh, impact for that. There is still a ship shortage right now, so using less server is better. And um, we think it will really um, be worth it to have seven times less servers instead of writing code with PHP on Python, or at least provide something for the people writing in it so that uh, they can write it in C++. Perhaps someday, if TP goes a long, goes a long way, we could automatically recompile everything to C++, who knows. So as, you, as you've seen, it's for efficiency and for uh, the efficiency in terms of uh, how much server we, we, we buy, but also for the, for the planet, for planet blue. But in this discussion, and in this journey, after we could uh, strip all the discussion like uh, we should do in Ruby on Rails or J JavaScript and so on, uh, we had the problem of, uh, yeah, we should do it in, with microservices. And I was like, no, we, we should do it with monoliths because uh, monoliths are simpler and we are a startup. So uh, starting out, we should do an MVP on the minimum viable product and uh, have something simple that we can later optimize and split to, to microservices. Um, and the problem is with this uh, is that when you have the problem, it's too late and you have to scale and then you have to work all night. We do that regularly uh, at Tipli, but uh, uh, because we, we, we like to code a lot. Uh, in comparison, when you, when you uh, build the microservices architecture, in principle, you can scale. But the problem is being able to scale is one thing. But do you know what we need to scale it is another one. And this was my point about uh, microservices, but the real reason I think, in my humble opinion, that microservices are selected in big uh, architecture at the beginning, it's because of uh, the Conway's law, is that uh, you are reproducing the um, communication uh, system of your, uh, of your enterprise or your organization inside your code, so that you have one team writing one service and another writing another. It's a good or bad thing, I don't know, because uh, with that you can go to speed and release things. But I think for an end user perspective, it tends to bring um, the developers to think of the product as two separate things, like all the core services, while actually a product is the complete set of things, the services, all the services on the client. And I wanted that we get in this context that at TP, we see the full product as being the client, the cloud on each part of the cloud, so that every developer could modify it and act on it, and that is get responsibility for the full chain, actually. So I found a nice, uh, interesting article from um, um, C++ uh, library author, uh, Leonid. Um, it's named, uh, his library is named OTPP, OTPP, sorry. <laughs> um, and um, the point is, he, 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 he coined a word that is named monolithization, and actually, he is right. Is it doesn't make sense that you need to choose it beforehand uh, before you deploy, actually, while you are building your application, if you want to have a lot of marshalling code between the different services of your app, or if you have, want them to have it in a single executable. And so he's enabling in his framework the possibility to have either each services separately run that are communicating over the network with marshalling code, or each services uh, run inside a one executable and directly called sparing ends uh, CPU time and enabling to scale when, er, when it will be needed as true. And most, most of the time you decide the website or microservices in different and then you notice that the optimization that you needed was at a, at a totally different level than the granularity that you selected. So this sounds to me a, a good alternative. And I think we should see a lot more of that because we want to release TP as a, as a community edition. And uh, I think for a community edition, uh, you don't need the scalability of all cloud. One developer that wants to run it for 10 people in his project or so, he, 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 don't need, he wants a simple executable that you can run, so it makes sense that you deliver him the app as a single app, single executable. On, on our end, it's normal that uh, because we have a lot of, uh, of traffic going on, that you can uh, split things. Uh, we see that uh, it's also naturally the machine code between services uh, 
can lose time on the same machine. Uh, you have uh, a difference of uh, 2,000 requests uh, seconds uh, when you have a microservice architecture or wherever you have a, um, a monolith. But uh, naturally, at some point, you need to scale horizontally. You cannot just pile up on very big machines. There are big, big machines out there, but they are costly. And in the end, I think it's really important to take care because all the people doing microservices are just shifting the problem in another way. But it's, in the end, it all ends up in the database or in the domain uh, service. And um, so most of the microservices architecture that I've seen so far, they end up uh, being the same as uh, a monolith that access a single DB. And in the end, the, the, the problem is at the, the database level and not uh, on the services side. But still, it's interesting. So that being said, uh, with Yannick, we discussed a lot. Uh, he was really a fan of microservices, had a really experience with that, with, with a big uh, user base before. And I was like, OK, I'm, I'm more like I built uh, web servers for embedded device. Uh, and I also built cloud stuff before. But it's like, yeah, we should do the monolith way and we should do the monolithization way. But ultimately, I lost. <laughs> I, I, I'm joking. I didn't lose fully, but uh, we came to a conclusion that uh, it was it made sense to have some services separated, differently from the start. Many TP is a bit like that. Uh, when you have a, a storage service that uh, is uh, dealing with uh, transferring source code to uh, build runners, it all runs on a Docker swarm, so it's Docker container running on many nodes that are across the world. So that uh, if there is uh, some problem in the location, TP will continue to be available because we have uh, the swarm um, um, rescheduling in another place. We tested it. Uh, the first time it was not because we wanted it. It just happened to to, to get it to have problem in Helsinki and so on. And so it, it rescheduled things uh, in another way. So we're just one minute downtime uh, in this context, but we are improving in that way. And uh, um, the, the different service that we have, they have written in uh, different languages. We have C++ on the storage, C++ on the core of the application. We used um, JavaScript uh, for uh, the identity provider. And um, if I give you a short overview of how it works, uh, and then I go into detail to what happened. Uh, when you use TP the first time, um, oh, yes. you, you can... Um, So the first time you will log in into TP, you will click on uh, on sign in uh, on the TP Build web page. And here, what will happen is that uh, we will request uh, your username on the uh, uh, mail from GitHub.com. And uh, if the user authorizes it, the TP API accounts receives it. And then a JSON web token is generated. And uh, we ask you to generate a TP vault on the first onboarding steps that will connect to further details uh, in your um, application to you, to your uh, source code hosting, uh, it can be GitHub, it can be other sources. Uh, and the thing is, is this is written in WebAssembly. When I click open the vault, what happens is that the WebAssembly software unpacks uh, um, an encrypted vault where all my passwords are uh, stored. Here, I already created the GitHub link, uh, so I, my vault has access to all my GitHub repositories. But the vault is only accessible by this browser, not by TP Cloud. We only know this passphrase as a user in this context or as a CLI, CLI user. And uh, once I've, I've all set up and I install the TP, you can install it to Visual Studio Code or you have command line installation for all platform. Uh, you can do a TP connect. And what happens when we do that? Uh, when I will do a TP connect, I just uh, open the terminal and type TP connect. I will do a clean connection. Uh, because I was already connected. What we do is that we ask you to pair your machine with TP, so that TP can extend your machine uh, as a as a as an extension of your RAM and of your CPU counts. So here you have a code to pair to check if it's the same uh, the same the same PC that you want to pair, so that nobody's stealing access to your to your data. And when I click on that, what happens is that an encrypted vault is downloaded to your machine. And when I go back to uh, to the to the terminal. Um, I'm, I'm connected. I know I have this encrypted vault that I encrypted in the browser, and TP doesn't know anything about that, so TP cannot access your source code. It can just uh, give you access to your machine to the source code. And here, when I tap in my, my passphrase, 
uh, I will decrypt the vault locally. And now this machine, my PC, has access to my uh, source code on GitHub and so on. And when I will build remotely or locally, it can use all these credentials. And if I update the credentials, it will always update here automatically. So on this uh, happens uh, to be able to build in the in the remote uh, in, in a remote uh, instance, so that you can build on a. For example, I'm on macOS, and if I would like to build uh, on Linux, uh, I will need to either start a VM or have a cross compiler. And TP brings you simply that it allows you to build on a remote Linux or on a local uh, environment that is uh, of the Linux um, by just connecting you with these nodes, starting them, and sharing source code. So what happens is we saw how I connected with the vault in WebAssembly. But what happens when I use a TP as a client is that I will uh, send my source code to the temporary uh, storage that I get that is only accessible from my vault. Uh, and this uh, temporary storage will be deployed to uh, to one of the nodes that has been created or to many of the nodes that have been created to build your software. But this enables you to either build on a small Linux or on a 128 core Linux to get a big speed up on your builds. And if you do that, just uh, just to, to show off a little bit and to see what happens. Uh, when I'm going to the, to, to, the, to, to the window here, and I click here on the TP, I get different uh, targets that I can use. Uh, and uh, then uh, in this program is a small JSON formatter uh, that uh, uses the Enderman JSON library. Uh, and uh, TP will pull the library automatically and it will build it on Linux. Uh, I'm on Mac, and now I will remote build on Linux. And uh, what happens there is that uh, a SSH key uh, or a private key, it's like an SSH key, is generated on this machine, and only the public one is sent to the cloud, so that you are the only one to have access to the remote environment, like if it was your PC. And uh, here it builds the software for Linux, uh, quite simply. And I could also say, yeah, but I'm also happy to have it for Mac, and uh, the same will happen, but this time locally because I'm on the same machine. So this this was about uh, what happens when you when you build with uh, with, with TP, and uh, so that you get an an idea of uh, what you can do. I join. I invite you to to try it out so that uh, you can explain to yourself how we implemented our cloud, while I'm going to explain uh, how it is actually built. So here we have seen the architecture and uh, we were like, yeah, it would be cool to have this and that and in C++ for web services and we should, re we should reinvent the wheel all the time. We should do all the frameworks that is missing. It's so cool to, to build C++ code. But then we noticed, yeah, but actually TP is a dependency manager as well. So it would be stupid to reinvent all the wheel. We could simply reuse code from others. So if you want to make a website like we did uh, with uh, our web service, like we did uh, for TP Build, that can scale, we, you can simply say uh, into TP, uh, in a .tp depth file, you can add uh, the GitHub handle of the library you want to use. This can, this can in the future, when we roll out more features, be auto-generated based on the header you include. But at the moment, you need to state it and pin the version that you want. You can just say, I want always the last version. If you want to try it out, I invite you uh, during the session to also do it because we will build the application a little bit. It is on GitHub. Uh, you go on tp-build with the OATPP starter. Uh, if you want to try it out where, where I'm doing it, it's uh, really cool. Uh, so let's go on the OATPP starter. So as you can see here, I have, um, oh, I am already one, one step uh, too far. Um, let's go back in the past. Okay, so I added uh, the OATPP um, version, and uh, I'm in the capacity now to say, yeah, I would like to build it for Linux. And uh, so I can build in the same environment as I would deploy in my Docker's and so on, uh, without having any differences. So that when I test things, it is exactly the same that uh, that happens uh, in the test environment as on the CI as on the deployment. So um, here I'm building with a small node, uh, not with a big one, but uh, it's still using the algorithm to, to help up a bit. And uh, what, I, what I did is just uh, build the app, and I can also build it uh, locally uh, to show that uh, we can uh, have many builds in the same folder on big cross-platform, be able to test different things uh, in a cross-platform manner. 
And what we will do is, um, how can we um, actually use that uh, to make a grid, uh, a grid web application? We come to this. But first, I, I would like to show what it takes with TP uh, to build the TP. It's actually one of the key that we have in our uh, company is that uh, we wanted to use TP to build TP so that we have C++ on the top in, with output space that we are not depending via TP. Uh, we are using WebAssembly that is provided by uh, mscript but that is wrapped inside TP as well. And we have also the JavaScript part that is embedding the WebAssembly and uh, some Docker on there. But the point is that when we do something with TP, uh, we can break the TP, so say. We are like building the product ourselves and we are using it ourselves. First, it was really important because uh, we didn't want to be like these people in the in this comic. Uh, like uh, for me, it was really important that we from the start use what we do so that we know what is going wrong and so on, and that we know what we need to fix and that uh, people, if we can use it, then people can use it. And uh, we are building LLVM and stuff with it. We are uh, building um, the full web service with it. We are deploying with it. We are doing a lot of stuff with TP. So I can tell you, we are dog fooding it, but we need you to get your use cases because we have C++ is many island. So please go on TP that build and register with the promo code. This will really help us to get some of your feedback to see how you use it. it will be really awesome. Um, so. An anecdote that uh, happened to, to us is that uh, we have TP build staging and TP build, uh, the official release. And so we are building the one with the others. But we went at some point uh, before we, we, were, we were better seated, but we were completely locked out of our own system because we broke all uh, by deploying staging, not noticing that something was broken. And we, not, we deployed the, the master one and then it was we broke everything and we couldn't come back easily. So we had to fix stuff in a compiled binary, and then we could uh, fix things. But now we have a better way. And this is like uh, building, dog feeding your software as a software developer is really hard, but it brings a lot in terms of value and quality of it. So how to build scalable REST APIs with uh, um, C++? I don't know if people here are um, comfortable with REST. I don't want to go deep on REST in itself. But just to give a short overview, I also spoke about what is REST at uh, the CPPCon, if some have seen my talk there. So I, I just give some input. So REST is just um, an architecture um, design uh, that uh, doesn't specify any standards and that just allows uh, to do crude operation on um, resources that are uh, defined as segments. Uh, in, a, in an URL. And typically, how it is implemented is that you have an HTTP server or um, quick server also in, in, the bit, in, in, in the meantime, uh, that you have a base URL. And on this URL, that you have segments that identify resources, like uh, in the typical example, it's the pet store with animals uh, that you can access um, to, the, to, to, a, to, a given, uh, to a given pet, uh, add it or remove it, modify it. And, uh, it's just really simple, and uh, typically the people nowadays use JSON, but maybe also XML and so, or some other a free text format. Uh, the point is, uh, with C++, it's easy to do, and we were actually astonished how easy it is to build a web app with C++ while everybody is telling you you should use JavaScript, Ruby, and Rails, and so on. Here you have a simple code that uh, is in, uh, in the OLPP um, framework. It's in the starter that I um, proposed before, that is in tp-build, if you want to try out. Um, it just say, OK, I have an endpoint that is uh, named uh, root, uh, and that is accessible on the, on the slash of the website. And the thing is, it sends back an object of type uh, DTO. This is something that uh, the framework OLPP is uh, using in the internally. It's a data transfer object. It's a way to specify what is expected and what is being serialized. Uh, I, I might go less macro AV uh, if I would design that from the top, but we said, don't reinvent all the wheel. Uh, just improve the wheels, perhaps it's, it's a good point. Uh, so um, we can uh, just look at it um, inside, uh, inside the starter. So here I have the, the, the controller that is, um, that is that is that is here. I could add another one and say, okay, uh, I want 
And hello, but says, Bonjour Paris. Typically, you would say so over French word like baguette and so on, but uh, I'm also French, so so I know it's not it's not necessarily fun. Um, so let's let's build it just uh, locally. Uh, and uh, what um, what we can do is uh, run the app. Uh, did broke? Ah, yeah, I broke something. It's like uh, it needs to be another identifier. And um, when I we run the app, we can then see the different messages coming back. Uh, with, uh, I'm already in good. So here I have a server that started on port 8000 normally. And if I go to my browser on the, I try out, ah, no, it's a uh, I mean, cool. Localized 8000. I get this hello world. Uh, Raw data is like this. And if I go to hello, I could have uh, Bonjour Paris in principle. So yes. So all built out of the box with oops, sorry, uh, all built out of the out of the box with uh, with TP and with HTTP, uh, just with one line uh, in the dependency file. So this is the basic to start, and there you can already have uh, a lot of requests being uh, served by seconds. So without needing to scale or to do anything complex, it's just uh, very very well done on the the. the you can really serve a lot of customers before or users before being able, having problems uh, dealing uh, with, uh, with scalability issues. So open API on REST. The point is REST is a bit like uh, freeform and anarchic architecture as we saw, uh, and it's not specifying any standards. So it would be good to have open API on the, um, uh, on the server so that you can specify what is the API of your server so that the server can uh, actually be uh, used by clients that automatically generate the clients. I, in the CPU talk, I saw how to write clients. Here I'm, such, uh, I'm presenting how um, to write servers. And happily, the people at OATPP, they, they did a great work as well. Is that uh, they added uh, endpoint uh, info as, a, as an addition to, the, to, to their uh, set of macros that generate just plain C++ types. It's nothing evil going in there, uh, where you can specify what happens. And there we were really uh, surprised because we did the same for JavaScript, for the, for the part that is doing uh, the account uh, access to GitHub and so on. And there it was like, just like terrible. We had to reinvent everything because it seems that people uh, tend to be less uh, using open API in uh, JavaScript than uh, or to, to do it in a way, in, in their way, uh, it was really complex to add this to an Express API while adding it to C++ was super easy and didn't take too good, that much time. And so if we do that uh, in our code base on the starter, uh, I can show you if you break this. And uh, I will just, I won't type it myself. I will remove my changes and ask it to type, to type it for me. Um, you check out. Open API, yes. So here you have the endpoint information that were added. I uh, commented out the security requirement for the moment. We'll come to JVT later on. And uh, here the dependency just changed that uh, we depends on Swagger, that depends on what people. Uh, and uh, this allows us to uh, now generate a web page with, uh, which, which can also generate a, a web client, but you can also use the technology that I showed in my separate talk uh, to generate your own client. We are even building something that is named OpenAPIPP, which is a C++20 template metaprogram to generate uh, clients uh, for OpenAPI. So uh, we are welcoming your help there because I think there is a need for, for uh, some work on the client side. Uh, so if I build that again, then what I will get typically is, um, is a, a web page where, this, where the swagger is there. And uh, if uh, let's just uh, take it. Um, so yeah, let's So it's running again. And then when I go now on uh, uh, Swagger, you uh, when I go on localhost, there is an additional endpoint thanks to uh, to to this, and we can see the the root endpoint that agrees the world. And I can here try it out. The, the client is automatically generated in Swagger, as many people know. 
uh, on the lower end response system back. Uh, and this information that is here are automatically generated just from what we had in the uh, endpoint description. It's really awesome and comfortable to build systems that communicate together thanks to this technology, thanks to OFPP, and uh, really easy to depend on with TP, actually. So, so if you want to learn more, there is this talk, or what you with REST API in C++, making it easy. It's from the client side. Uh, here we are speaking server side. So server side, how do you scale uh, an architecture, a cloud architecture, uh, and deal with security at the same time? There is a true issue uh, with security is that you have to, to trust things and to check things. And the point is the, the only source of truth that you have in a web application is your data store. And if you have um, information that comes from, uh, if you have a request from a client on it, when you are on one of the 10 instances of the service, and each of the instances of the service is going to ask the database, is this user a real user? Is this user authorized to do this and that? Then you are just offsetting actually the, 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 the scalability problem to the database that you need to scale as well because she's, it is always uh, asked uh, regularly. There are super database uh, uh, that were developed in love in Paris. Uh, I'm thinking to Edouard Alligan uh, that, uh, that, that could deal with that. Um, but uh, um, I mean, it's better to not uh, abuse of it. So we use JSON Web Token at TP. And, uh, the JSON Web Token it's sent as a HTTP uh, authorization header. I can show you on the website how it happens. Um, when I go to uh, when I finish my my tour here, and I go to manage my subscription, actually, I could and you should do it. Uh, don't forget to do it. Uh, uh, I could act, I could enable my my uh, my cloud subscription so so that you can try it out. Um, oh, uh, let. Uh, just show the console. So here I'm claiming the coupon to um, to get a uh, drill nose for free uh, for uh, because I'm a CBPP uh, attendee like you, and uh, so uh, you get then a medium build job. And here was done the, the request, and in the request header actually there is this bureau token being sent. And what is interesting about the bureau token is that. Um, it is a, it is a, a JSON that is base64 encoded and that is signed asymmetrically. And what is really cool about JWT is that they built a website uh, where you can uh, view your token. Oh, I should have copied mine. Um, so let's copy that. So someone's stealing my account at the moment. It's possible if I see the. The, for the next 10 minutes, it's possible to steal an account by taking a screenshot and generating the token. Ah, so you just remove the bureau. And so what we see is that uh, it's made in three parts. You have the you have the error uh, of the of the token that is giving the algorithm type. Uh, here you have the, um, the the data that is in there. So a JSON Web Token has always like uh, the some information that are requ required on others that you can add freely. So we added the nickname of the user and uh, his uh, um, mail address from his GitHub account, uh, the type of grant that is given, and then when it was issued, when the token will expire, and uh, what user ID it refers to. Uh, so it's a subject what is token authorized. And in the end, you have the signature that is getting, that is being verified by a by a key that we have on the server, and the private key is only owned by your uh, special service uh, for accounts. So uh, we secured that uh, well. So normally nobody should be able to steal that, and uh, all the different parts of TP are auto authenticated with this uh, token. It's also the client also use that, and uh, what we use to 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 parse it is like a small uh, TP account uh, GWT script that we use to, to generate JSON out of it and to get the base64 out of it. And to actually decode and check the dependency, we just use uh, the cppjwt uh, library that is uh, on GitHub. So it's github.com slash aaron 11.299 slash cppjwt. And we said, okay, uh, it didn't build the first time. So we saw ah, it was needed JSON and SSL. So we added this in the list. And this is all you need to use this library. And uh, we can go in the actual code of uh, TP um, to look at this. 
to use this um, this, this token, we built a TP authorization handler, which is actually uh, something from RFPP that you can then use inside your controllers. And then you can decode here the, the token with the JWT library, as we use with the TP dependency. And uh, we have then the, um, the, the algorithm selected. And uh, if the error code is wrong, then uh, is, is, is triggered, then we consider that, uh, that uh, it was not a valid uh, authorization. Otherwise, you can be um, uh, granted access. And then as a user from uh, the from the from what PP, you can simply say, OK, I'm I'm adding on my endpoint a security requirement. And I need the, the object of type TP authorization object that contains the duty. If it is authorized, then this function will never be called if the uh, JWT isn't, isn't valid. And it involves no calls to the database. So it is really uh, an efficient way to scale because you have all the services knowing you are authorized for 10 minute time frames. After 10 minutes, you, the client needs to re refresh his token. So you have two token, uh, access token and refresh token. And uh, then he can uh, get the other stuff. So we just saw that. It's the implementation of the authorization handler. No need to talk more on this. And once we have now uh, authorized people that we have a uh, scalable uh, Docker container running on a swarm across the world to uh, build the C++ code, we need to actually um, store information about the machines we start to uh, build the application. And I'm like, most of the web developers out there, they are dealing with uh, object relational mapping uh, framework. There are as well some for C++. Um, but I think it's something that you don't need nowadays anymore. Uh, because what it is in object relational mapping, it's a thing that maps SQL table to classes. Why would I care about SQL tables, actually? Uh, I have classes. I'm a C++ developer. Uh, I can rely only on classes and have my object in the database. Uh, I, I mean, it would be perfect, and I don't need any RM. So we said, yeah, we invent a little bit the wheel there. Uh, we'll store object directly in the database. Uh, we'll do no ORM for no SQL. And we selected the less obvious uh, SQL database to store that. Uh, so what you're going to store here is the machines that are created in the different cloud providers, be given you a wanted Windows node with TP, or given you want a Linux node, or if you want a Mac OS, it's being uh, this deployed uh, in different uh, uh, um, locations. And uh, to do that, uh, actually, we just wrote a plain old data type in uh, C++. Uh, we are using Boost uh, here uh, to, to have an unique ID. And there is a little bit of SQL, because as I said, we, said we use the less obvious NoSQL database. Actually, we used Postgres. And Progress uh, is really cool because it delivers uh, the full power of Postgres with the a special data type that is named JSONB. Actually, you can say, OK, I have a table that is only an entry of JSONB. And JSONB is a binary JSON uh, storage format that is optimized based on the uh, JSONs that are repeated in the entries, but still giving the flexibility of, of uh, being able to change anything in the database uh, data format without uh, needing to change the database schema. And uh, so you can still add indexes to have an unique index. Like, like here on the line eight, we are creating an index on the ID uh, field of the, of, the, of the JSON object that is generated out of this script. And uh, this gives a, an insane performance. It's, uh, it's really fast. It's, if, if it's fast, it's fast like a normal colon access, but without the pain of having um, to use uh, tables that you have to create, that you have to update. I always hear um, from other uh, web developers the, the point, oh, I, we are doing a, a deployment and we need to, um, to, to, to migrate the data model before releasing the version because we changed this and that, and uh, there was bug on the migration, and we don't know what will happen with the production data and so. We at TP, we ultimately we wrote PP, you can deal migration, but who needs that actually? Because uh, you can deal with that in the sense when you have C++ stood optional, you don't need to have any migration script. You just need to make optional the fields that you don't want to, to have necessarily anymore or that are new and that are not in the new in the old uh, data. And uh, you can use variant to, uh, to, to have different type of things. So you can encode in your app the, the fact to deal with the old data, which uh, 
at some point might not be ideal anymore, but most of the time, it, it is not necessary to make big migrations uh, to make a, to 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 have a, to have problem. Still, you can do it. We have a version ID that is created by your PP and so so you can easily uh, make a migration script and we did it. But I think in the general case, uh, dealing with JSON, C++ uh, type like optional on variant, you can simply deal uh, with any kind of uh, backward compatibility issue you want. It's like what uh, the people of gRPC and protocol buffer are doing. They say, okay, when you have a field that you don't want anymore, that is uh, going to be deprecated, you just mark it as optional. And I think this is something that uh, that is really powerful and reduce all the complexity of dealing with data. Because rewriting all the database is not a safe thing. You need to have a bit of SQL, uh, but it's SQL that you can copy paste, or I would say that you can automatically add in a function that will be templated or that will be uh, generated based on the table that you want to, to, uh, to modify. And the only thing is uh, that you say, insert all the JSON I give into the table that is as JSONB. And for this, you do simple uh, JSON uh, serialization. You can use the library we use for serialization. It's a cpp-pre slash JSON on GitHub. CPP-PRE is the things that we would like to get into Boost or into the standard at some point. So we put every all the stuff in CPP-PRE. Uh, perhaps some people get it before us in the standard or in Boost, so we can remove the lib and use the, their own. And then it just dump that to the database. Um, for uh, serialization, uh, there is uh, naturally always this problem in CPP that there are no um, um, serialization support uh, because of um, lacking support for uh, reflection. It's actually no more the case with C++20. Even if you don't have reflection, C++20 has so much cool feature that you can combine. But as I showed in my talk at uh, CPCon, you can make uh, like if you had reflection because you can combine non-type template arguments uh, as const expert, um, compile type argument deduction, and um, abusing um, the deduction of uh, the deduction of uh, tuples. Um, how to say that? Um, uh, that you that you split a tuple in in, uh, in multiple uh, in multiple variables. Uh, this uh, allows you to iterate over restrict. Uh, there is boost PFR that is doing that, and so you can have code that is like this. And you can then serialize that without any issue, uh, or deserialize that without any issue, without having to repeat anything to add a macro below, like uh, boost fusion and abstract or boost and abstract. You just have serialization out of the box. I invite you to, to look at the, at the template and to try it out with TP. With TP, you can build with C20. Uh, so you can build in the cloud or locally. So if I go on, on, uh, on this project, I could uh, simply say, uh, yeah, I, I would like to build uh, this uh, WTPP starter with Swagger on um, TP Linux, uh, build T Linux uh, 20, and I would like 128 cores for it, so that the build goes fast. And uh, this you just get out of the box with TP. The environment is need to be created and then data synchronized, and normally then the build should, uh, should go on. Um, and uh, so I invite you to try it out because it's really wonderful how you how fast the build can go. Oh, four points. Back. Yeah, okay. And uh, so as a conclusion, I would say uh, MongoDB is a nice NoSQL database that many people use, but Postgres has actually MongoDB inside. Uh, with this JSONB, and the performance is incredible, and uh, the simplicity, as we have seen, is uh, is uh, just what we like because you are dealing with data. You don't want two things in the way of your user data. And uh, as I said, who needs migration when you have uh, special data types that uh, encode the meaning of uh, what you are doing? I mean, this is the strength of C++. You can encode things uh, that you cannot in language that are more loosely typed. Um, so TP, at the end, for the moment, we, we spoke of how we built all the web applications, up, but we didn't speak how we deploy the machine on the many, many call machine on different cloud vendors. So what we do at TP is that we rely on the, on the TP client to send us uh, two files that are the description of the environments. 
when you go on a TP uh, installation, uh, you have in your um, in your home folder .tp slash uh, environments, and then you have uh, all the environment that TP supports. So that's really a lot. And for each of the environments that we support officially, there is a Pecker file, which is a description of how the, 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 the system is supposed to be built. It can be a Docker that is built. It can be a Windows machine uh, that is not a Docker or a Mac OS machine. Uh, and the toolchain file, which is a CMake, because TP removes you the pain of writing CMake yourself, but it doesn't avoid you of using the good things of CMake, like all the toolchain that are specified so that you can reuse environments that are built for CMake and so on. And under the hood, TP generates CMake list for you. And uh, it is allowed in the end when the, the typically sends the request to build, it sends the uh, data for the, for the environment with the hash. If the hash was already uh, deployed in the cloud on a snapshot of the machine was already made, then you get this snapshot with your special SSH key um, added to the machine so that the machine can be used for your builds. And otherwise, it will be created with Packer and then uh, terraformed. Uh, and then a lot of, uh, of our uh, API is going to be used to um, actually check if the machine is started and running. We have a booster zero checker for, uh, for checking if the, the node is ready so that you get fast information. And uh, we registered an, a domain name for it. So you have also a node where you can run a web service for your debug tests so that you want to try out uh, something. Um, you want to connect to some other uh, web service. You will be outside of your network, thanks to TP. Uh, on being on the internet to try things, but you don't need to. By default, it's closed. You can open it if you want. And um, it is also then to, to, to build at a scalable way because once we build the environment, it's quite a lot happening there uh, because we control the different cloud and we connect to different machines and we make different uh, setup of, of uh, action on them and we transfer some big files and so on. But uh, once we did that and uh, your machine is ready for you to build, we get out of the way. And it's that we scale infinitely because we give you uh, access to your set of machines directly uh, that you can build on it so that we don't uh, interfere anymore and that you can just build as you want. Uh, this is where we get the, the high scalability. The only uh, limiting factor is uh, the storage uh, server that is really performant as we built it. We are still improving that. Uh, continuously, and we would like to have your feedback on it. Um, so we are uh, we we there. We transfer the source code temporarily, temporarily on the on the storage. The storage then synchronizes that to the machine, and uh, it uses as a as a pipe to synchronize in both way. Uh, the the binary can come back on your local machine if you want, and the source the source changes goes up to the cloud. Uh, until you stop the live session, when you stop using TP uh, on the day and so, then the, the data are, are deleted uh, so that you don't have data that gets stolen or so. And uh, anyway, these data are encrypted on all the nodes where your data were uh, stored are completely destroyed after the after the build is finished and you don't use it use them anymore. So there is little chance for things to be stored in the cloud. Any case, TP can also be used on premise. So if you have special requirements, it's possible. So one big problem we have uh, encountered by building TP is uh, that we got real zombies in our uh, in our application. So we are super happy doing high performance C++ at cloud scale. Uh, and um, you know, in C++, one thing that is lacking out of the box that many interpreted language have is having a, a stack trace. And uh, the point is, the advantage of C++ is that quadrants that other languages mostly don't have, like uh, Java and Python, they have quadrants, but not really out of the box and easy to use. So uh, we have quadrants and it's a full debug uh, information, but we don't get like stack trace information just in the logs to, to fast check something and say, oh yeah, it is this bug, I can fix it and so on. So there is people that uh, help with that, but, but in your case, it generated true zombies in our code. So if you want to learn, please register. If someone register in the meantime, uh, I will tell you the story. Otherwise, uh, I will keep it for me. No, okay. Ah, someone registered, okay. So you can see before I tell you on TP that you are not alone uh, building applications. Uh, when you go, I have a admin dashboard on my other screen, but 
when you go on the web page, you can see that we are not uh, uh, we are not a single user there. Uh, we have uh, live 160 live build calls running at the moment, and uh, we have a 10k uh, build score ever deployed. Only in the last uh, two weeks, there are 4,000 4, calls deployed. Um, it will be awesome if we can get to 16k. If you can make the cloud uh, burn a bit. Uh, not like in Strasbourg, huh? don't don't make it run like in Strasbourg, but uh, at OVH, but uh, uh, make it make it make it run. Uh, if you have 16k, we open champagne, uh, good champagne, and we invite the user that make them burn. Um, so, and uh, you can take my word my words for it. Uh, so the zombies in TP, it's we use the boost stack trace, which is a super nice library and it's awesome uh, that we enabled on, on signals. Uh, handlers. Um, we didn't use a Boostazio signal set if you are uh, accustomed to it because you need to be in the actual signal handler for the crash to get the full stack trace because if you are in ASIO, you are no more uh, in the same stack, so you don't get the information. Uh, and so in case of 6.7, six, then you, you have the stack trace being generated. And in principle, the idea is that you don't need to be async signal safe, like uh, uh, the Unix uh, book from Mr. Butenov uh, explained uh, because you are crashing, so it should be the last uh, action that you do. But actually, what we did is someone uh, tried to build the 128 core with macOS, and we had like a map which had no entry for uh, the macOS 128 core cloud um, uh, provider at that point in time. And then what happened is that this handler crashed. And started to generate stack trace, but over user could continue to run, but we were getting a gazillion of mail of errors and of notification that upload was doing bad. And this was this took like hours to actually crash and restart the container. It's because we had integrated um, in the sense of MVP, the stack trace temper with the address to line. You can configure boost stack trace to not use address to line, so you don't get this problem. But there you had like stack trace being generated of uh, 6F in repetition without the application quitting and with the application continuing to work. And uh, this was pretty, pretty bad. And each time it would take and load the full binary and rebuild, and uh, re-scan the line and find the address to generate the stack trace. Uh, while it's cool to have the stack trace, having this uh, behavior made us uh, consider optimizing it. So we could happily, but uh, yeah, it's something to be prepared for. It was a really astonishing on a Friday evening. Uh, we had a, like a real, real fear that everything breaks down and that we were hacked and so on. But it was just with stack trace spawning a lot of address to line and uh, letting zombie process behind and the, 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 the Docker swarm not being able to reboot because. The app didn't exit at that time. So uh, this was for the zombies. Um, I thank you very much for your attention and for being online. I hope we can go back soon uh, in real life, um, in meetings uh, and in conferences. I would like to go to CPP Paris when the Eiffel Tower is again uh, near the, the conference location. Uh, I think the um, organizer of the conference, they did a really great job um, keeping the community up and running. Um, I hope we can help the conference in the future as well as we grow. If we have more users, we can sponsor, we can do things. We need you. Please register on TP Build. Try it out. Give us feedback. We love brutal feedback. We want to fix all problems that you have. Please contact us. Come to us. We, we want to make C++ builds of dependencies and builds themselves faster and simpler. If you have any question, don't hesitate. Also to, go to chat in Discord or uh, on the mail or on the website, we have an issue tracker and you can post, no problem. Thank you very much.